The direction of your life will be determined by the song that you sing. Everybody, you included, are singing a song and it's steering your life and you might not even realize the song you're singing. This is many of us right now. We've swallowed the hook from one of our culture's current three songs and it's pulling us towards a future that I don't know that you want. Where are we? In the Bible! Let's begin at the beginning, shall we? The Bible begins in the Old Testament, written around 3,500 years ago. The first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, are known as the Pentateuch, or Books of the Law. The next 12 books, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Woo! That's a lot. These are known as the historical books. This brings us to the books of the Bible known as the wisdom literature. It starts with Job and then into a collection of 150 lyrical poems known as the Psalms. The direction of your life will be determined by the song that you sing. It's one of the secrets of faith. By the way, I'm Kyle, the teams that make the stuff you experience at Crossroads, one of our online pastors, teaching pastors. And we're in this series right now on the book of Psalms from the Bible. It's a collection of some of the oldest and most profound songs in the entire world. And here's why it matters. Because everybody, you included, are singing a song and it's steering your life and you might not even realize the song you're singing. You ever had that moment where you're in a restaurant or a store or wherever and a song starts playing in the background and you're shopping and you're eating your food? You know, you're kind of really aware of it. But then hours later, you're at your house mowing the grass, doing the dishes, and all of a sudden you, you hear it coming out of your mouth. And it's like, I even like this song that much. How did it get stuck in my head? Why am I singing it? That happened to me last year uh, with this song. I'm going to play it for you. This is a real treat, by the way. I happened to bring my, my recorder. I've been saving it since third grade. This song is so catchy. I promise you know it. I'm gonna play it, not well, on this recorder. Your mom knows it, your mailman knows it, and you're gonna get it within 10 seconds. Okay, ready? See how long it takes you. It's Old Town Road. That song doesn't even make any sense, but it gets stuck, stuck in our head. Why? It's because every song has a hook. That's an actual term used by songwriters. Here's a quick download about hooks from Crossroads Music's Robbie Ryder. I bet all of you could finish that musical phrase without me playing another note. You know why? Because it's an amazing hook, that's why. Now, every hook is designed to get stuck in your head, to get stuck in your pocket, so you take it everywhere you go. And any songwriter, who's doing their job is going to use three ingredients to make a great hook. First of all, it's gonna have rhythm. Second, it's going to have repetition. And third, it's going to evoke an emotional response. So go with me for just a moment. Our English language is made up of 26 random letters and we put them together so that we can speak and we can write and communicate. Now, if we went to a toddler and said, here are the 26 letters, make sense of this, they would just think, what are you, are you, what do I do with all these? But what we do is we set them to a melody, we set them to a rhythm, and we make it repeatable so that all of a sudden our kids are learning this. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. And that is how you make a great hook. Did you pick up on that? Robbie said a hook has three parts. It has rhythm, it has repetition, and it evokes an emotional response. And when you combine those three things together, 
you just hear it over and over again. It's got a good beat to it. It makes you feel a particular something. When that, when that happens, the hook works. And what we say is that the song is catchy, which means that we get caught. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just like, a, like a fishing hook, right? It comes in, it sounds good, so we swallow it and it, and it, got, it just has us, just pulls us in a direction. That's a hook, they're, they're so strong, they get stuck in our head without us even knowing it. Here's why this is so critical. If you want a new season in life, you want more peace, you want more joy, you want more confidence, you wanna, you wanna stop feeling so angry. You wanna stop feeling so defeated all the time. You wanna stop feeling so down and this so whatever. You have to spit out the old hook of the song you're singing right now and you have to learn a new song. It will not happen if you don't. This episode, we're zeroing in on Psalm 40, which was written by the most famous and significant king in Israel's history. He was a military legend who defeated Goliath. He established the capital city of Jerusalem. And in true Renaissance man fashion, he was also an amazing songwriter. And we're looking at Psalm 40 because it holds the secret of how to see this kind of change in your life, how to sing a new song. Maybe you've heard parts of this psalm before, or didn't even know it was part of the Bible. David wrote Psalm 40, and I want you to listen to how he described this new kind of life. Here's verse three. David writes, He, God, has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. See, David described this new life as a new song in my mouth, new, new words that I'm saying, new, new, new thoughts that I'm having that I'm expressing to, to myself and everybody around me. And this is a major insight that you have to wrap your mind around. What you say, specifically what you sing, what's on repeat with rhythm that evokes an emotional response will 100% steer your life. Not your emotions, not your neighbor, not, your, not the government. It's the song coming off your own tongue. Here's how James 3 describes the power of your tongue. Because if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they're so large and driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. See, when you're a fish, that one right here, when you're a fish, a, a hook gets set in your mouth and it pulls you where you don't want to go. It pulls you out of the water onto a boat deck where you die, bad. Why did that happen? It's because you swallowed something you thought was good. But the hook ultimately pour, pulls you towards this dangerous future, literally takes you to your death. And this right here, this fish, this is many of us right now. We've swallowed the hook from one of our culture's current three songs, and it's pulling us towards a future that I don't know that you want. What are those top three songs? I think uh, coming at number three, personal, my top three list, I think. I think number three is fear. The, the lyrics of fear are, the economy's tanking, gas is up, this is awful, I'm gonna go broke, I'm gonna, everything's gonna be awful, I'm just gonna, my, my bank account's going down. And listen, friend, if you swallowed that hook, I want you to know you're headed towards a future of crippling anxiety and a life without peace. That, that's where the hook's pulling you. Maybe you're singing along to the lyrics of our second best hit, Anger. Uh, the key line in the song of anger is that they're the problem. The, them, the other ones. You know, Joe Biden's the problem, Donald Trump is the problem. It's, it, it, it's them. Friend, if you've swallowed the hook of anger, I'm telling you, you're headed towards a future of bitterness and, and resentment. Or maybe you swallow the number one hit of our current day, I think, which is some version of eat, drink, and be merry. Live for right now. Do whatever feels good right now. By the way, it's a form of apathy. I have no vision for my life, so I just do good. I just do what feels good right now, no matter what it costs me, no matter what it costs people around me. Friend, if you swallow that hook, you're headed towards a future of addiction and perpetual dissatisfaction. Nothing will ever make you happy. And I'm not trying to guilt trip you here. I'm trying to help you. Because listen, th this was me last year. I, I got to the end of the year and I realized I spent all of 2021 singing along to the song of pessimism. It's some version of like that anger and fear put together. Everything's gonna be bad and I'm, and I'm mad about it. That's what I kept saying. That's, that's what I sang to everybody around me. Now, I didn't know, but if you'd asked my wife, if you'd asked my kids, you've asked my friends, they could have told you the song I was singing. 
Maybe that's a move you want to make. Just, just ask. You don't know what it is. It got stuck in your head. You don't know what's coming out of your mouth. Ask the people around you. And I'm telling you, it was pulling me to a place I didn't want to go. It was making me more and more and more pessimistic. It was a hook pulling me towards a future I didn't want. Listen, if you're singing those songs, I, I just want to ask you, is it taking you to the future you want? Because the hook's pulling you. And we think it's just words coming out of our mouth. I think it's just, it's just an innocent complaint. Man, I was just, I'm just venting. I'm just venting. I'm just, I'm just sharing how I feel. Isn't that okay? I thought we could do that. Yeah, yeah, venting's fine. But when it becomes a rhythm in your life, when it becomes a repetition in your life, when it, it evokes this amazing, this huge emotional response from you, it, it's more than just words. See, the single mistake the fish makes is seeing the hook and thinking, yeah, that's fine. That's good. But it's not. It, it, it's not even neutral. It's deadly. And I want to be clear, this isn't me making stuff up or you know, being hyperbolic or whatever. The stakes here are very, very real. The Bible makes this clear. It's incredibly dangerous territory. Listen to Proverbs 18, 21. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. That, that's huge. Death and life are in the power of what comes out of your mouth. That means that you can set a hook in your mouth that pulls you towards death. Or did you catch the good news? You can set a hook in your mouth that pulls you towards life. Now, the words that pull you towards a negative future, do you, do you know what you call that? Uh, it's called a curse. <laughs> do you remember the first time you ever cursed? I, I remember I was eight years old. My mom had given me a Christian video game for Christmas. I did not ask for it, by the way. As for the original NES, this is the game. Bible Adventures. I do not recommend it. It's basically like Mario Brothers, except instead of uh, Mario and Luigi, you were Mary and Joseph on a donkey, and you're trying to make your way to Bethlehem so that baby Jesus can be born, I guess, in the manger. I, I don't know why that was a big success story, but that's what you're trying to get to. And I was playing this game one day, and I kept dying. I kept falling in the pit. Couldn't get my little donkey with Mary and Joseph to like hop over the pit. Kept, kept dying. And I got so mad. Little eight-year-old me had heard words on the bus, heard other people say them. They, they, they looked amazing. And so I just looked around, like, I don't see mom. And I just yelled, I just yelled the F word. <laughs> and the problem was, my mom happened to be right behind me, and I could not see her. So what did she do? She grabbed a bar of soap, actual bar of soap, looked just like this, and she put it in my mouth a rough air for a very long, oh my gosh. She left it there for a very long time. Why? She didn't want me to curse. Oh my gosh. That's very bad. Don't do that to your children. That's a very bad idea. Why'd she do that? She didn't want curses to come out of her son's mouth. Friends, I'm telling you, a curse isn't a four-letter word. A, a curse is a hook that proclaims a negative future for you and the people around you and pulls you in that direction. The stuff that we should wash out of our mouths are curses like, I'll never amount to anything. Curses like, it's hopeless. Curses like, I'll always be stuck like this. I'm never going to get ahead. I'll always feel this way. Or I'll always be alone. I'll always be overlooked. I'll always be left out. Those are curses. They're not just words. It's a cry proclaiming defeat. But I don't know if you know this, God is a God of complete and total victory who promises to rescue every single one of us. Hey, I'm Andy. And I'm Hannah. Here around Crossroads, we believe that giving is a spiritual discipline. That's exactly right. And if that's something that you're open to and want to take part in, you can do that super easy by going to the Crossroads app, clicking the gear in the corner, and simply clicking Give. Now let's get back to the message. Okay, I want to be clear. We titled this series, Psalms, All the Feels, because God can take all of your feelings, the good ones, the bad ones, the happy ones, the sad ones. He can take your cries. He, he totally can. And it can be healthy to simply say how you feel to him. I'm not helping you if I'm not clear. The kind of cry that gets his help in response is not a cry of whining. It's a cry of waiting. The first miracle of Jesus was changing water into wine. And the miracle you need to ask for and work on in your life right now is to change your wine into waiting. Listen to the beginning of Psalm 40 again. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. God has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. Now the word that David uses for cry right there, it's the Hebrew verb shavah, which means a cry for help. It's not a cry of complaint. 
It's not a cry of outrage, it's a cry for help. See, you yell out for him, not at him. You might be like, well, it must have been easy for David to write those words, Kyle. I took third grade English. I, I, I know those verb tenses, they were in the past. God had already come through, already changed his life. That's what changed David's song. If my life was already awesome like David, I'd sing a new song too. Not so fast. See, now we're at the secret faith part of it all because what David wrote in those verses that we just read that sounded like it was in the past tense, like it had already happened, it hasn't at all. How do I know that? Because just a few verses later, David wrote about his present situation. Psalm 40, verse 12. For innumerable evils have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me so that I'm not able to look up. They are more than the hairs on my head. Therefore, my heart fails me. See, David's present situation was awful. So why, why in the world would David write the first three verses in the past tense as if they'd already happened when they clearly haven't? Well, first, let me talk about why he didn't. It wasn't to magically speak something that isn't true into existence. There are people out there who are gonna teach you this thing on the lines of the name it, claim it idea. If you just name it and claim it, you, you get it. Problem is it doesn't work. Watch, I am six foot six and I can dunk. I'm still five foot six and I still believe I cannot dunk. Maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I can jump super high, I don't know. I'm just saying, it doesn't work that way. There's only one being in the entire universe who can just speak things into existence. God, and good news for you and me, I'm not him, it doesn't work for me. See, David did that, he spoke in the past tense because he knew the secret. The song that you sing will steer your steps, it will pull you towards a future, it will pull you towards life, or it'll pull you towards death. And he wanted to set a hook in his mouth that would steer him towards who he believed God to be. A deliverer, a healer, a provider, a savior, a rescuer. See, David was stating his trust in God's name to be those things for him. He was setting his own hook. Now you've heard that Jesus said that we would be fishers of men. A lot of his early disciples were fishermen. A lot of his ministry was around the Sea of Galilee. A lot of fishing happens right there. You're gonna be a fisher of men. Do you know that work starts with you? See, the new song is the new hook that pulls you towards belief in God and you set it yourself. So even when the present is painful, you set the hook in your mouth and you sing about God as peacemaker, as deliverer, as provider. And when you do that, you're pulling your heart towards the peace that comes from that truth and experiencing it now. And when you do that, your, your wine turns into waiting. You go from everything is awful to the rescuer's on his way. Rather than talk or call out curses over your life, you just call out God's name. And this is where your true faith is completely exposed, completely laid bare. Because waiting on God, it's a terrible idea if you don't have faith, if you don't believe in his goodness. Now, why would you wait patiently on someone who you don't trust, you don't think is your corner, and isn't gonna come through? That makes no sense. Don't wait on that person. But if you believe in somebody, God, who's good and for you and victorious and strong and powerful and ultimately will win, why would you not wait patiently for that, that God? Why would you not call out his name? Psalm 40, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. The, the question of this message is really, do you believe that? Do you believe that he hears you when you cry out for help? When some, someone calls out your name, you, you, you like turn around and answer, right? And depending on how they say it, you probably respond uh, differently. My wife, Sarah, she calls me love. And I know she says love. It's like, oh, <laughs> hey, babe, what's up? If she uses my actual name, Kyle! or worse, my whole name, Kyle Joseph Branson, then I know things are really bad, I'm in trouble, and I respond you know, faster. I just don't, I know something good's probably not coming. The point is, when someone calls our name, we turn around, ready to respond, you know? Kyle, yeah, what do you need? Same is true of God. The Bible says that when we call out his name, we say, God, he goes, yeah, what do you need? Turns around, ready to respond. Jeremiah 33, three says, call to me and I'll answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. We see this happen in Jesus's life in Mark 10. The situation happens, it happens many times. He's walking along the road, he's got places to go and someone calls out his name. 
Interestingly, in this situation, Mark 10, the guy calls out, son of David. It's a blind guy named Bartimaeus. Calls out, son of David, one of the names for Jesus. And Jesus' response was this, Mark 10, 51. Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? Okay, so when we call out, God turns around, ready to respond and do whatever you ask next. You say, God, yeah, what do you need? Just call out his name. And hang with me here. This is, this is so, so important. There are 950 different names and titles for God in the Bible. 950. You can Google them, look at them, amazing names. But there's actually one name that you're calling out all the time right now in your life, in your old song, without even knowing it. It's the one name that God gave the one time he was directly asked, hey, what's, what's your name? It happened when Moses in the Old Testament saw God in the burning bush. And it was a time in Moses' life where God was calling him to lead. And so he calls him to go and to lead. And Moses' response is, God, who am I? I? I am unable. I am unwilling. I am unqualified. That's what he says. And then finally, after all this complaining, Moses finally stops. He goes, hey, by, by the way, God, what's your name? And this is what God says in response. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now, I am is a Hebrew word that means I, I was, I am, and I will be. It's about the timeless nature of God. It means that who he was is who he is and is who he will be. So if, if God was faithful, then God is faithful and God always will be faithful. Moses is saying, I'm, I'm unqualified. I'm unable, that's, that's my name. So remember, when you say God's name, he turns around to listen. I want you to track with me here, track with me. What's another way to say God's name besides God? You say, I am. He says, yeah, what, what do you need? And then you say, destined to fail. God says, what? You say, I am. He says, yeah, what do you need? You say, overwhelmed. God says, what? That's not, that's not my name. That's not your name. What, what do you mean overwhelmed? You say, I am. God says, what do you need? You say, insecure. God says, that's not, that's not what I named you. What, what, that's not who I am. What, what are you talking about? You say, I am. God says, what do you need? You say, just so over this marriage. I'm just done. You just said God's name. You said, I am, and he's ready, he shows up, he's there, but you're singing the wrong song, a song of complaint, a song of whining, not a cry for help. Sounds different. Well, what happens if you change it? Just, just a little bit, you can change it significantly. You say, I am. He says, yeah, what do you need? And you say, protect it. God says, I got you, absolutely, I, absolutely. You say, I am. God says, yeah, what do you need? And you say, deliver. God says, yes, absolutely, that's who you are, because that's who I am. You see, when, you, when God adopts you in his family, when you believe in him, you take his name. And God's last name isn't insecure. God's last name is not unable. God's last name isn't incomplete, unqualified. God's last name is deliverer, healer, rescuer, restorer, victorious. That's God's name. And when you say, I am those things, God says, amen, I hear you. I hear you belief. I hear you faith. And I am on my way. That's the secret of faith that David puts on display in Psalm 40. That's why he writes the first part in the past tense. That's how much he believes it. David goes, I, I, I know I'm heard. I know I'm delivered. I know I'm established. Therefore, I am now singing a new song. Now, right now. And I know maybe that's a leap too far for some of you. That's okay. There's a step between that and where you are. It's in the very last words of Psalm 40. David writes this, but I am poor in need, yet the Lord thinks upon me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, oh my God. So right now you've got an old song in your mouth. It's pulling you in a direction you don't want to go. And the solution is so simple. You just spit out the hook. You do the thing the fish wishes it had done before it got yanked out of the water to its destruction. You just you spit out the hook. You stop saying I'm unable. You stop saying everything's awful. You stop saying they're the problem. You stop saying I'm gonna do whatever makes me happy right now. You stop singing that song. You sing a new song, a new song of deliverance, of hope. You say, God, would you put a new song in my mouth?
message taught you anything or made you curious to learn more about us, we'd love to know who you are and hear from you. You can create a profile at crossroads.net. We've got podcasts, shows, articles, and episodes just like this one that are catered to you and what you're looking for. That's all we got for today. See you next time on Crossroads. There is a sacrifice that everyone can make, but too many people miss it. Today, we're exploring the sacrifice of gratitude and how it stops us from chasing things and instead gives us the ability to reflect, come to a new realization, and rely on God.